Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, Dr. Gassif. You're on. How, how are you? Yes, I, I'm sorry I was here, but somehow I guess you couldn't uh, see me. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Oh, okay, so do I have now control of... I think you are the, the host, inshallah. Okay, okay. So uh, let me go to my PowerPoint. Uh, while you are going, and I will, inshallah, uh, just a few words. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, we are going to start, inshallah, uh, the second segment of our Sunday uh, program. Um, as you heard from our uh, uh, posts and the website, uh, you know, our topic is the Quran and the science. As you know, Al Quran al Karim is not only our uh, book of uh, recitation or worship, uh, the main purpose is Hudalil Muttaqeen. It's, it's a guidance, and there are so many relationships of Quran and with other, uh, you know, uh, disciplines and the science. One of them is definitely science. And for this you know, purpose, I think the best person uh, would be Dr. Gasser Hathout. He is also one of our khatibs and lecturer at the Islam Center of Southern California. We are always you know, happy to see him and hear from him. And we benefit and learn from him a lot. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him uh, very much. And I would like to invite Dr. Gasser, please welcome for his lecture. Yeah, thank you very much, Sheikh Hassan. Uh, thank you. I will uh, just uh, begin uh, straight away. Are you able to see my screen and my pointer on the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so I had given a uh, three-part series of khutbahs on a new topic uh, called neurotheology. And the what I will do is I'm just going to try to hide this thumbnail video so that I can um, see the screen fully. And my main hope is really to reach, of course, everyone, but the young adult Muslim audience. And the rest of this lecture will be explaining this title, uh, inshallah. And some of it, of course, will be repetitive from the series of khutbahs, but I also, my intent here was to be able to dig deeper and fit in things that the khutbahs just did not have time for. And in the first khutbah, we talked about the philosophical question as to whether faith or the capacity for faith was innate. And we reviewed some Quranic evidence and then you know, talked about philosophical points of view. And I won't review any of that here, except for this verse, which is verse 172 from Surah Al-A'raf. And uh, this verse says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانَ الرَّجِيمُ وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا أَنْ تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّا كُنَّا عَنْ هَذَا غَافِلِي So, and mention when your Lord took from the children of Adam, from their loins, their descendants, and made them testify of themselves, saying, am I not your Lord? They said, yes, we have testified this, lest you should say on the day of resurrection, indeed, we were of this unaware. And so what the verse is saying is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the children of Adam and made them bear witness upon themselves that he is their Lord. And this is done so that they don't come on the day of judgment and say, we were unaware of this. And we said that this verse has been interpreted by our scholars in three different ways. One way is a very literal interpretation that at the time of the creation of Prophet Adam alayhi salam, every human being who was going to be born from that time until the day of judgment was also created, made to bear witness to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord of the heavens and the earth, and then sort of snapped back into non-existence each of them then to be born at their appointed time and die at their appointed time. Uh, and when they are born, they have inside them subliminally in their subconscious, this notion that God is the Lord. Another interpretation is, no, it is not literal like this, but that God has given us this innate capacity for faith in a similar way that he, that he gave spiders the innate capacity to spin a web. Spiders raised in isolation from any other spiders still know how to spin a perfect web. It's inside them. A third interpretation is that the heavens and the earth are filled with signs that testify to 
uh, the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So two of the three interpretations are somehow either literally or figuratively that faith is an innate capacity. And we can liken this, as we have said before, to the power of speech. When we see in Surah Al-Rahman, insan bayan. He created the human being and he gave him the capacity to speak or to communicate via speech. So the verses are saying very clearly that this is a God-given capacity. And we know that many linguists like Noam Chomsky uh, of MIT uh, believe indeed that this is an innate capacity. You don't have to teach children how to learn a language that is inside them. You then teach them the language and you in fact don't even have to teach them the language. You just talk it in front of them and they pick it up. That is different, for example, than first having to teach a child how to ride a bike, then teach him how to do tricks with that bike. You don't have to teach a child how to learn a language, you just teach them the language because this is an innate capacity. And the important point is these innate capacities seem to have a correlate in our brain. We do everything with our brain. And so scientists have now discovered that there are areas of the brain and just to orient everyone, I mean, we, we can't go into all detail about each thing. We only have a limited time in the lecture, but this is a magnetic resonance image and it's something called a functional MRI. And we'll talk more about what this word functional means, but it's a magnetic resonance image of the brain, an MRI of the brain. Many of you are familiar with MRI or may even have had an MRI. And it turns out that there is a center in the brain, it's in the left frontal lobe of the brain in an area known as Broca's area, that is the speech center. It's how we make speech. And if someone has this area damaged by a stroke, for example, then they have what is known as a Broca's aphasia. Aphasia means they cannot make speech. And there's an area here that is not highlighted in the temporal lobe known as Wernicke's area, and that is the area of the brain in charge of understanding speech. So one area makes speech, one area understands speech, and they are connected together in a brain network that is a sort of God-given network, or we are born with this network with the capacity for speech. So the question becomes, do we have a similar brain network for faith? Since we are asked to believe in God, and since faith, has intellectual, emotional, physical components, like for example, when you're praying and you start to cry because you're overwhelmed in prayer. It has an intellectual component of belief. It has a lot of emotional components. And in the interest of time, I won't go through the verse from Surah to Zumar. I'll just leave it up here for you to quickly glance at. But this verse talks about those physical components when, when you know, we start to get goosebumps uh, it, it, as we are listening to the Quran or reciting the Quran in our prayers, and then our skins and our hearts soften to the remembrance of Allah and so on. So these are very clear physical uh, manifestations that I'm sure many of us have felt indeed in prayer. So the question becomes, does faith have these brain correlates as well? Are we in a sense hardwired for the capacity for faith? the way we are hardwired to be able to learn and understand the language. And so that is what the science of neurotheology is. And you see that scientists have now begun to look at faith. They looked at speech, they looked at vision, they looked at hearing. And now they're asking, does faith, which is very important in the lives of many, also have a biological correlate? And you can see you know, that this has been tackled in really two related parts. One is, is there a genetic component to faith? We will save that to the very end of the lecture. And one is, you can see these titles here, the God part of the brain, uh, why God won't go away, astaghfirullah, as I mentioned in the khutbah, I don't like this title. It does not have the reverence for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I would like, but it is written by a pioneer in neurotheology, Dr. Andrew Newberg. And what he means by this title is why is it that humans, no matter how scientifically advanced they get, keep believing in God. Why does this concept of the divinity not go away? And his argument is because we are hardwired for the spiritual experience. And so this is the field of neurotheology, ex exploring 
the hardwiring of the brain for faith. And you see indeed that Andrew Newberg has authored a book called Neurotheology as well. And others are also um, writing books about the subject. And it is in fact a, an exploding field in science right now. So to see what science has uncovered, I want to just orient you a little bit uh, about what are the tools that science uses. Again, these are magnetic resonance images of the brain. This is one patient, this is another patient. And most of us are familiar with images of the brain or of the chest and so on as anatomic images. We want to know, does the brain have a stroke? Does the brain have a tumor? You know, does the brain have a bleed? And so for example, this patient has a bleed in an area of the brain called the left parietal lobe. This is the right side of the brain. This is the left side of the brain. This patient here has a stroke in the same area of the brain. Uh, you can, you, you, even if you've never seen any of these scans, you can see that this area here is different than the rest of the brain. This is a stroke in an area of the brain called the left parietal lobe. This is what imaging normally does. We just look at the anatomy of the brain and see, is there a problem with it? And what is that problem? Is it a bleed? Is it a stroke? Is it a tumor? And so forth. However, using these same tools and other similar tools, scientists have been able to turn these tools to also look at how the brain is working, the function of the brain. And this area is known as functional imaging. We can take a very normal brain, shine light, for example, in people's eyes and see what areas of the brain respond or light up um, to, to that visual stimulus. And so the areas of the brain that are in charge of processing visual stimuli are in the back of the brain in an area called the occipital lobes. When we hear something, alternatively, it is not back here in the occipital lobes that lights up, but here in the temporal lobes, where we have something known as the auditory cortex. So functional imaging is not looking for pathology. It's not looking for abnormality. It's looking for how normal brains work and what areas of the brain do what. And so functional images allow us to look at normal things like, is there a hearing center in the brain? Is there a vision center in the brain? And so forth. Um, and by the way, it turns out that the front part of the temporal lobe is in charge of hearing, the back part is in charge of understanding. Uh, and so when you learn a language, you sort of hardwire it into this back part. So I, for example, do not speak Chinese. So if someone speaks to me in Chinese, I hear the sounds, but I can't understand them. But if they speak to me in English or in Arabic, I not only hear, but I automatically understand. I can't even force myself to not understand. And this forms an integrated network. In so that's how these functional images work. So then scientists turned this functional imaging um, onto the problem of faith or the issue of faith, uh, basically using these tools to then study what parts of the brain are active in the experience of faith more generally and more specifically, the experience of prayer. And so this is a different type of functional imaging known as SPECT scanning, single photon emission computed tomography. And what it does is when a part of the brain becomes active, more blood flows there. And this sort of scanning measures the blood flow and therefore indirectly brain activity. And so these are very, very rough images. They don't have the definition of the MRI images we were looking at, but these are images from uh, Professor Andrew Newberg, and they are of Catholic nuns focusing on a catechism, reciting it over and over, uh, uh, you know, a religious verse uh, or, um, uh, you know, some sort of uh, religious uh, saying. And so, when they were in this prayer, you notice that there's a difference here between their right frontal lobe when they're not praying 
and the frontal lobe when they are praying. And the scale here is that the red implies the highest blood flow. Yellow less, blue even less than that. And so this area of the brain, known as the attention area or control center, and we will um, uh, highlight that a little bit more later, becomes active when they are focusing on saying their prayer. And not only that, but a language center back here, here's the baseline scan, when they're not saying the prayer, here's the prayer scan, a language center back in the parietal lobe also lights up. And you can see here, just to give full credit where it's due, Dr. Andrew Newberg spect images. So he was able to find that indeed prayer activates certain specific areas of the brain. Now, there are, so the attention center is activated. We're paying attention to what we're saying. The language center is activated as we pray, and we expect those things in some sense. Um, then there are other very, very neat correlates that I want to bring to your attention. And to be able to do that, I need to orient you about something. Remember when I was talking to you about anatomic images and I pointed out and I said, this patient has a stroke in the left parietal lobe. Well, this is actually, this patient is from a paper that we published some years ago about a very interesting syndrome called alien hand syndrome. And this is one of the variants of alien hand syndrome that this patient has. Now, what is this alien hand syndrome? Well, before I can explain what that is and why it's in this talk, I want to draw your attention to something that all of us probably take for granted. Imagine, for example, that you are sleeping and you wake up in the morning. You automatically know that your head is separate from the pillow. The pillow is not part of you. Your head is just resting on it. And you know that this is your right arm, this is your left arm, and so on, and they, they are separate from the bed. They are parts of you. Believe it or not, you know that because there are areas of the brain in charge of letting you know that. You don't get confused and think the pillow is part of your head, and you don't get confused and think that your uh, right arm doesn't belong to you. And those are sort of orientation areas and boundary areas in the brain that define for you these things totally automatically without you even having to think about it. However, sometimes when these areas get damaged, that automatic function is lost. And what can happen is you get something known as alien hand syndrome, where you no longer recognize, as in this particular patient, for example, that your right arm is actually your right arm. And this patient had a stroke as they were sleeping and they woke up and the way we found out about it is they started screaming that there was a severed arm in their bed. And the nurses ran in and of course the patient's right arm was not severed, it was the patient's right arm, but they could no longer recognize that that was their arm. The boundary function lets you delimit your body from other things have been lost. And this syndrome is, is terribly interesting. It's a very fascinating syndrome. Uh, when this happens, sometimes people actually lose control of that hand. That's why it's called alien hand syndrome. So that hand then starts to act with a mind of its own, if you will. Um, and there have been cases of smokers that every time they would light a cigarette, their alien hand would take the cigarette and, and throw it out of their mouth. And they were very frustrated because they couldn't get a smoke. There have been cases where they're driving a car and the alien hand, which is of course their own hand, but now they've lost control and awareness of it, grabs the steering wheel and tries to swerve them off the road or to strangle them and so on. But the important thing here is the boundary area of the brain is in the left parietal lobe that delimits your sense of self in space and in time. And one of the very interesting findings that Andrew Newberg came up with is that in intense prayer, here's the orientation or boundary area. You notice that it is red, meaning it has a lot of blood flow in the baseline state. 
And when people are in prayer, that red goes away. What does that mean? It means that they are losing their sense of personal boundaries in space and time. And I, you may have experienced that same notion in very deep prayer where we are so focused on the prayer, if inshallah it's a very soulful, soulful prayer, that we are no longer even aware of what room we're in, how much time has passed. Uh, and this has been found across the board in, in religious people. For example, in Buddhist monks, when they reach a nirvana-like state and feel that they have joined the cosmos, almost an out-of-body experience, and in other religionists too. And the only way to understand the significance of this, of course, was for you to uh, understand this notion of the boundary area of the brain and the alien hand syndrome. And when, when that becomes less active, we're sort of no longer aware of ourselves in space and time. Uh, and we sort of lose that sense of, uh, of personal boundary and, and kind of dissolve in the experience of the prayer. So that is a very, very interesting set of correlates. And all of these things go into showing that um, it seems that we are in some sense hardwired to be able to have these intensely spiritual experiences. Now, one very interesting thing is that whereas some things seem to go across the board in different prayers, Muslim prayer seems to also have some unique attributes. And one of our attributes that when we pray, we are very focused on the notion of surrendering ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, submission, Islam. Of course, that is the meaning. And so we see that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, and he says to him, aslim, aslam to li rabbil alameen. He says, I um, have submitted myself to the Lord of the worlds. And so when um, scientists have very recently started to look at Muslims in their intense prayer, what have they found? So Andrew Newberg again published a case series of the neurophysiological effects of altered states of mind during intense Islamic prayer. So let us look at what happens to the brain of the Muslim when he prays. Remember before we talked about this right frontal lobe when the nuns were doing, reciting their catechism. That became redder when the nuns were in prayer. Now here are two Muslims. Here's a Muslim in the baseline state and then a Muslim in intense prayer. You notice that this right frontal lobe, this little bit of red here, disappears. Same thing with this person. In the baseline state, you have red in the right frontal lobe, but unlike the nuns reciting the catechism where this area would grow even redder, the red disappears. That means that this area of the brain is actually becoming less active. And we said that this area has two functions. It's the attention center, and it is what is known in, in neurology as an executive control center. It is the center that has us control our impulses, that has us feel that we are in control of you know, what we do, what we think, and so forth. And so if we surrender ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and relinquish control, we would indeed expect that this area would become less active. My sense of control that I am in charge actually deactivates as I submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a quote from Andrew Newberg's paper that I showed you here about how he interpreted these findings. He said, it is hypothesized that the changes in brain activity may be associated with feelings of surrender and connectedness with God described to be experienced during these intense Islamic prayer practices. So this facet seems to actually be unique in Islamic prayer, in our Salat. And uh, again, you see that there are brain correlates for this experience that we have in prayer. There's a hard wiring here that lets us have these experiences, just like there's a hard wiring that lets us see and hear and 
produce speech and understand speech. And very interestingly, when you compare what happens with the Muslim who self surrenders and their executive control center becomes less active or with the nuns who are focused on a particular recitation and their attention and control center becomes more active. When you have an atheist who has practiced meditation and they are asked to meditate about the idea of God, their brain does not change at all. Why? Because they do not believe in God. And so Andrew Newberg, comparing this to the nuns, he said, we also looked at the brain of a long-term meditator who was also an atheist. And what they found is that there was no significant increase um, in their attention centers uh, because they do not have a belief in what they were meditating about. So these are really profoundly important results. This field is still very much in its infancy, but you can see kind of the significance of the results that are being found. Now, it is very interesting how some scientists have interpreted these findings. So here's a book called The God Part of the Brain. Uh, and the interpretation, because there seem to now be brain areas that are hardwired for the spiritual experience for faith, this has been turned around to say, okay, so the concept of God must be just a product of our brain. And why is that? Because the instinct to believe is the result of an evolutionary adaptation. This is a quote from a website about this book, uh, the Amazon website, a coping mechanism that emerged on our species to help us survive our unique and otherwise debilitating awareness of death. So that basically that the brain, because it has areas that respond in spirituality, has created the concept of God. Now, this is by no means the view of all scientists, but I am very surprised that even some scientists have this point of view from these scientific findings. Why? Because we see when the Quran tells us, for example, He is the one who brought you into being and has given you hearing and sight. And I'll stop here with the interpretation of the verse and just go back to the functional images I showed you that Yes, the brain has been hardwired to see and to hear and understand. And because the brain has these areas of hardwiring, we don't turn around and say that that tree outside is a figment of my imagination because I have hardwiring that can produce or, or uh, correlate to visual images. And that these sounds are just you know, uh, hallucinations because uh, I have a brain that can produce sounds, uh, can, can understand and hear sounds. So why is it that when we find areas of the brain that are hardwired to be receptive to the recognition of God's existence, we turn around and say, oh, well, then God must be a figment of our imagination. Um, and in the khutbah, I shared this example, that a baby who is in his mother's womb, who is being given their nutrients through the umbilical cord. So they do not know things like hunger. They do not know things like the taste of food. Their brain is already, when they are born hardwired, an area in an area of the brain called the lateral hypothalamus is a hunger center. And we have an area uh, here in the brain uh, between the um, bottom of the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe that is the taste cortex. And this baby is born with the capacity to feel hunger and the capacity to experience the taste of food when they do neither in the womb. And I don't turn around and say, because the baby is hardwired for this, then this concept of food must be an imaginary figment, um, you know, a, 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 an unreal thing, or the concept of taste is a figment of people's imagination. No, and if an alien were studying a newborn baby's brain and understood what these areas are, they would immediately deduce that there is such a thing as food because the sense of hunger proves that there is such a thing as food. I am hungry for something and that is food. And it proves, this taste center proves that there's such a thing as taste. 
And so if an alien knew nothing about how we live, that we eat food and that that food has taste, that it's not just a tasteless paste that gives us nutrition, but we experience nothing from it, they would immediately deduce, yes, there must be a thing, uh, such a thing as food, and that is what this hunger center is all about, and that food must have such a thing as taste. So I'm very surprised that in the face of this scientific evidence, um, some scientists are trying to turn that around and saying, okay, well, because we are afraid of death and because we are afraid of nothingness, we use our faith centers in the brain to dream up a concept of God. I think that the more logical conclusion is what is being said in Surah Al-Rum, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهِ That set yourself steadfastly to the faith that this is the nature that God has created people upon. That if we are being asked to be faithful, to believe in God, we should be given the brain capacity to do that, the equipment in the brain, the networks in the brain, the centers in the brain that would allow us to then connect with the divine, to believe in God as we have been asked to do. And I'm gonna skip these slides in the interest of time because I want to show you that yes, people are now studying these issues extensively. So papers on the neural correlates of religious and non-religious belief the neural basis of cognition. Many people are now publishing papers exploring the hard wiring that we seem to have for the experience of faith. So I'm not asking you take my word for it because I'm a Muslim, because I'm a believer, etc. This is becoming a huge sort of area in science right now. And using functional MRI, we obviously don't have time to go into this. And you know, one would need a PhD in neuroanatomy. But I just wanted to show you this is real stuff. This is from one of these papers I just showed you. The areas of the brain that form the so-called so spiritual networks, multiple areas in the brain, and you can read their names here, areas in the inferior frontal gyrus, medial, free frontal cor medial uh, prefrontal cortex, and so forth. Um, and very interestingly, these functional MRI studies have found that there are differences in the pattern of brain activation between religious and non-religious beliefs. So it is not simply that I believe something to be true, and so I use the quote unquote belief center in my brain. So for example, when a believer is told the statement that God exists and heaven exists and hell exists, their brain responds in a certain way. When they are told the statement, that apples exist and pears exist and bananas exist, they believe both of those sets of statements, but the brain patterns of activation are different when you are believing a religious concept from a non-religious concept. And that is an extraordinarily interesting and important finding that religious belief seems to have its own set of networks. Yes, I use some of the same areas in the brain, but I use them in a very particular way. And so what is coming to the forefront now is that the brain doesn't have a distinct quote unquote God spot. Like when I take away the speech center, Broca's area, the person can no longer speak that faith is different than that. It's more complex and more subtle than that. There isn't one area in the brain that if it's damaged by a stroke, then the person goes from being a believer to an unbeliever because they have lost the belief in God area of the brain. But they're saying that we have found a neuropsychological basis for spirituality, but it's not isolated to one specific area uh, of the brain. Uh, this was a, a very important paper from the University of uh, Missouri. Uh, and so spirituality uses many parts of the brain, but in a well-defined sort of net, well, I shouldn't say well-defined, the areas in its infancy, but networks that are becoming better and better defined. And so here's another paper, Cognitive and Neural Foundations of Religious Belief. Again, I want you to realize that this is a scientifically legitimate area of investigation that many scientists are now publishing in. This is not 
you know, me telling you, hey, yeah, of course, the brain must have areas of faith. Um, and this paper is saying that based on the above psychological structure, we hypothesize that religious belief relates to specific patterns of brain activation. And this is very important because you may think, well, if I'm using areas of the brain that are used in other things anyway, is there really a specific network? And all of these papers are telling you, yes, there is a specific network. And let me just give you one example um, that your liver cells and your brain cells have the same set of genes. You don't have different genes in your liver than you do in your brain. You have the same set of chromosomes and they carry the same set of genes. So how is it that your liver is a liver and your brain is a brain? because the network of genes that are activated make one cell a liver cell, the network of genes that are activated make another cell a brain cell, and we know that we all start from one cell. And the different patterns of activation underlie all of the different specializations. So same thing, parts of the brain that do get used in other ways form, connect differently in the faith network than in believing uh, logical statements or mathematical statements and so on. Um, uh, same thing with the orientation area, knowing where my body is and where my hand ends and where you know my head ends and the pillow begins and so forth. There are specific faith networks. And that's important because it would be problematic if we were asked to do something that we don't have a network or a capacity to do. So what you're looking at here, these two are actually the same flower. This is what we see because we cannot see in the ultraviolet spectrum. This is what a bee sees because the bee has receptors in its visual apparatus that respond to waves of light in the ultraviolet that we can't see. Same thing here. This is what we see. This is what the bee sees in the ultraviolet. And if we had been asked to function by going to flowers with a certain pattern, but we had not been given the brain network to see that pattern, that would be problematic. And so to me, as someone who is interested in both faith and science, it is very important that we are discovering that the brain does have networks that allow us to do what we have been asked to do, and that seem specifically hardwired to achieve that. Let me give you another example. Dogs, for example, have no networks for chess. So if you ask dogs to play chess and that that is what is required of them, they would be unable, not only do they not have opposable thumbs to move the pieces, that's a minor thing, but they do not have a brain capacity that can be trained to understand the rules of chess and play a strategic game of chess. And if we were in the position of dogs and chess versus humans and the belief in God, we had no capacity and no brain network, that would be a problematic situation. And so it is an important finding that indeed those networks exist. Now, the third khutbah in the series focused on, okay, if these brain networks exist, which we now strongly believe that they do, what does this mean outside of the experience of faith? So for example, I have a brain network that allows me to wiggle my finger. I think, and God knows best, that when I do that, there's no effect beyond the intended that I wiggle my finger. I don't think that this activating the brain network that allows me to do this has further ramifications on my emotional health, my psychological, uh, you know, uh, attitudes, my physical health, and so on. It's just, it achieves the end in itself. So the question becomes, when we now activate these spirituality networks, what happens? And so when I gave that khutbah, I titled it, this is your brain on prayer. And the question was, what happens when we run the spirituality program? Normally, when you run a computer program, the computer just spits out whatever it was that it was programmed to do. Programmed to wiggle the finger? Okay, I've wiggled the finger. So the question is, does religious practice have effects beyond itself? And as we noted in the khutbah, our scholars have always claimed, yes, 
that, again, we are not playing a cosmic game of Simon Says, pray so that you can show obedience to God, and that's the end of it. For me, that would be sufficient. I wouldn't need any other effect from prayer than that. If I can use it as my tool to demonstrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I am submitting myself to you and I am obeying you in what you have asked me, that would be more than sufficient. But our scholars have said that out of God's mercy, we're not being asked to do arbitrary things that have no effect beyond themselves. Yes, we demonstrate our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but that these must have other ancillary beneficial effects for the human. And science has started to find this. So it turns out that when we activate these spiritual networks in the brain, it ties into other centers. And so the brain, for example, has what is called a reward center that is that same good feeling when somebody gives you tremendous praise or something wonderful happens to you and you feel really happy um, or uh, you feel that you did something really good and you're so proud of yourself. And it's that same reward center that's actually involved in the euphoria of uh, some drugs, some illicit drugs. And so the, the, this scientific paper in neuroscience letters is titled Rewarding Prayers because it found that the spiritual network is also connected to the reward centers in the brain. And again, we don't have time to go through all of this text, but basically just read the headline here, repetitive prayer activates reward systems. And that religious prayers can activate these reward systems in the brain to make us feel good, to make us feel worthwhile, to make us um, feel uh, that we have done something wonderful and we feel really good about it. And other truly unexpected baffling things. So functional MRI, we said, you know, when you shine a light in somebody's eyes, you can see the areas of the brain that respond to visual stimulation. Well, we can do the same thing with pain. You can give people electric shocks, for example, while you're scanning them in the MRI scanner and find the areas of the brain that respond and light up and how strongly they light up with um, the pain. And the higher the pain, the, the more intense the lighting up. And it turns out that when people are in a state of prayer and you do this, they feel less pain and the MRI scanner shows that the centers of pain light up less. So prayer can actually blunt physical pain. It ties into the pain network and modulates it. A totally unexpected result. And here, yeah, I'm quoting from that paper. The results show that pain intensity was reduced by 11%. So people rating their pain scale, it's reduced by 11%. What the MRI scanner measures as the activity of the brain is reduced. And the people's rating of the unpleasantness of the pain is reduced by 26%. And that is during religious prayer compared to secular prayer. So you may say, well, you don't notice the pain because you're preoccupied in praying. That's not true because the control group was people involved in some sort of secular prayer. Like, uh, you know, human beings are wonderful. Human beings are wonderful. Human beings are wonderful. And you could keep repeating that and focusing your mind on that. But when you are praying to God Almighty, compared to a secular prayer, your brain activation centers for pain are reduced. Your sense of pain is reduced. And how unpleasant that pain is to you is reduced even more. And most interestingly, most of the pain reduction pathways that we know use a, a pathway in the brain called the opioid pathway. You may know opioids, like for example, um, if people in intense pain in the hospital are given things like morphine or codeine to reduce the pain. That is reduces the pain through the opioid pathway, it seems that religious prayer reduces the pain in a totally different pathway that's not completely understood uh, that works through frontal and parietal lobes. Uh, so that, that to me is, is entirely, entirely remarkable. And so because people have now started to realize that activating the spirituality program has uh, implications beyond itself, beyond just bowing and kneeling or even saying, I believe in God and truly believing in God, that it does things like reduce pain, 
uh, they've started to look, okay, so what are the implications of spirituality for health? And in the khutbah, we talked about mental health, behavior, physical health, and we, we don't have time to explore all of that. But let me just very quickly reflash for you through those highlights or headlines that people who pray regularly cope with adversity better. And a lot of scientific studies have shown this. And so you can see when the Quran says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu sta'inu bis sabri wa salati inna allaha ma'as sabirin. Oh, you who have attained to faith, seek aid in steadfast patience and prayer. That indeed prayer has effects on the brain, those brain systems that help you cope when you're in a difficult situation. Some people cope, some people cope less, some people completely go to pieces. Uh, it, 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 under adversity, it turns out that prayer activates those coping mechanisms. And so this is a scientific statement. It's not just a stuff for law, a feel good statement or a cliche or something like that. You can now see that when the Quran says seek help in steadfast patience and prayer, indeed prayer does help you in adversity, well being and happiness. A lot of papers have found that religious people are significantly more happy than non religious people. 79% of the papers, and again, while I was telling the young people, that doesn't mean that 21% of the papers found that non-religious people are happier. It turns out less than 1% of the papers found that non-religious people are happier or that religious people are less happy. They're unhappy because of their faith. So 79% found that spirituality enhances your sense of well-being and happiness. 20% found no difference and less than 1% found that there's an inverse relationship. And this is again, as I tried to point out in the khutbah, a very, very significant result. Why? because it's actually not logical, at least not by the logic of the new atheist movement that has taken to buying placards on buses saying there's probably no God, so stop worrying and enjoy your life. Because we as religious people, we have obligations. We have to pray five times a day. That's, that's not easy or straightforward. When I'm at work, when I'm traveling, when I'm, uh, we have to fast, we have to pay zakat. We have to control our impulses. We have to try to be nice. We have to try not to get angry. We have to try to be truthful. We, we worry that we're not measuring up to, to the demands of our faith. We feel guilty when we sin. We're concerned that we're going to be punished and spend an eternity in hellfire. Is such a person supposed to be happier or a person who's a hedonist, who feels that they have no moral code? There are no restrictions. Enjoy your life, enjoy yourself, you're gonna die and there will be no consequences. Well, it would certainly seem that the hedonist would be much happier, but subhanAllah, the believer turns out to be much happier in numerous psychological studies. And why? Because it turns out that we were talking about the reward system in the brain activated by prayers. Here's a headline from another article that prayer activates happy brain chemicals, those chemicals in the brain that make us happy. And what I'm going to do is um, I am going to uh, just keep moving forward because there are a couple of other areas I'd like to cover in the few minutes remaining. But the same thing has been found for hope, optimism, meaning and purpose, self-esteem, sense of control, positive character traits. All of those seem to be more in people who practice spirituality. Less depression. Less people are less prone to depression if they are regularly spiritual. And if they do get depressed, they have a higher rate of recovery from depression. And a significant number of studies have found that prayer gives better outcomes than standard treatments for depression, standard medical therapy, or control groups who do not get any treatment at all. Same thing for anxiety. People who pray regularly are less prone to anxiety. And when they have anxiety, they can recover from it through prayer as a regular regimen in their life better than medical therapy. That doesn't mean in, that I'm in any way telling you that if you have depression or anxiety, do not have medical therapy. By all means, you must. But also add in this regular regimen of spirituality, because when the Quran comes and says, those who say our Lord is Allah, and they remain steadfast, the angels descend upon them saying, do not fear, do not grieve. This is a scientific statement now. The spirituality network activates 
things like serotonin release that combat depression um, and, and activates networks in the brain that combat anxiety. And so when the angels come and say, do not fear, do not grieve. Well, do not fear, do not be anxious, do not grieve, do not be depressed. And so this is a scientific statement and we are just beginning to understand how regular prayer interacts with other areas in the brain to mitigate these effects. Now, I'm going to skip this. I'm going to skip this. And I want to go into something that I did not have a chance to touch on in the khutbah, and that is physical health. Because changes in brain activity, well, the brain does things like control your heart rate, your blood pressure, all of us understand what it's like to be anxious and feel your heart start to race, right? That, that's being driven by changes in the brain. The brain senses anxiety or senses fear or senses grief or whatever it may be. And it does have physical manifestations. So does prayer even reach out to the physical aspects of our body? When we activate these spirituality networks, it, ter it turns out that yes, a very significant number of papers have shown that those who are religious and spiritual have a significant inverse relationship between spirituality and heart disease. The more spiritual you are, the less heart disease you have. And if you do have heart disease, the recovery rate from things like heart attacks are better in people who are religious and spiritual and practice their faith than people who are not. And, you, and, and this is shown, and again, I don't have time to review the literature with you. I'm just flashing you the headlines. Immune function turns out to be better in those who pray than those who don't. So 71% um, of studies have shown that R slash S, religion and spirituality, have significant positive association with immune function, better T cell function, better B cell function, uh, more antibody immunity. They've even found that in AIDS patients, lower viral loads on the same medical regimen in people who pray versus people who don't. So 71% of the studies reported significant positive associations and no high quality study found an inverse or negative association that prayer negatively affects your immune system. One study reported mixed findings. Cancer, of 20 methodologically rigorous studies in the li medical literature, 60% of them found an association between religion and spirituality and lower risk of getting cancer or better outcomes when people get cancer and no papers reported worse risk or outcomes. So if this were a random process, some of the papers would show you get better, uh, uh, lower risk and better outcomes, some, some would show worse. And it's, it's very interesting that 60% find a positive correlation between religion and spirituality and outcomes in cancer and uh, likelihood of getting cancer gets, gets lessened and no papers find worsening outcomes. Mortality, right? So they're saying the most impressive research is that religion and spirituality improves mortality. You, we, we have a lower mortality rate. We live longer when we are religious and spiritual. Only 5% of the papers reported shorter longevity. 75% found longer longevity, more longevity, 20% found no effect. So this is very, very strong scientific evidence. And again, you know, you can go back to this lecture. It should be online, inshallah, and review these things that um, an increased survival of 37% is highly significant, is what the author of this review article is saying, and equivalent to the effects of cholesterol-lowering drugs or exercise-based cardiac rehabilitation after heart attacks on survival. Prayer is that good. It's as good as cardiac rehab exercises and um, cholesterol lowering drugs. So the bottom line, it turns out that prayer is incredibly good for you. These are not my words. This is from an article called Your Braid on Prayer. Uh, it's linked to psychological health, biological health, and so on. And um, the, the upshot though, is that this has to be done regularly. And I'm going to sort of end here and go to this very important quote from Andrew Newberg. Uh, he wrote another book, How God Changes Your Brain, 
talking about many of these things that we've just talked about, that the spirituality network has these broader effects on your psychological health, on your physical health, and so on, mediated by these brain networks. And to me, this is one of the most significant quotes of all. Many of you are wondering, do I believe in God? This guy who's a pioneer of the field of neurotheology, finding all of these positive effects, and he co-authored this book with a co-author named uh, Mark Waldman. He said, I'm not even sure God exists. It says my associate Mark, Mark Waldman here, doesn't believe God exists at all, but I'm not sure. But what we can prove to you through things like what we've covered in this lecture is that believing that God exists is fundamentally good for you as a human being. And hopefully I've been able to share with you some of that. And I hope you found this interesting and instructive and new. And uh, I, I am particularly speaking here to the young adults. Uh, I hope that this has been at least different for you, something that would pique your interest for further study. And if that is the case, then I consider that God has blessed me with success. Uh, none of it is my own. If I have failed, then that of course is my failing and my fa failing alone. And I end here with um, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen and Assalamu Alaikum. And uh, you know, uh, I don't know if we have a minute or two for questions. Um, I'm certainly happy to take you know one or two questions. I don't want to run more over time, but I thought it was more important to cover this material. So thank you very much and Assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Assalam, Dr. Yasser. Thank you so much for this beautiful, wonderful presentation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless your family members. I'm looking if there's any questions, but I don't see so far. Okay. Uh, and why, uh, why don't yeah. we end so we can pray Dohar on time, inshallah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. There's so much that I guess. Dear brothers and sisters, also, I would like to remind you all these uh, beautiful, wonderful presentations and the lectures are recorded, and you can always check our Facebook. And then also the YouTube channel that Islamic Center of Southern California has. So please go and listen if you missed any of the lectures of Dr. Gass or the khutbas. Also, the, recently we've been hearing uh, the topics that you just heard. And again, I would like to extend my gratitude and thanks to you, Dr. Gass. Thank you so much. The pleasure is all mine. God bless you. God bless everyone. God bless you for all the wonderful work that you're doing on our behalf, Sheikh Hassan. Thank you. So Take much. care and salam alaikum. You too, alaikum salam. Dear brothers and sisters, before I finish, I would like to remind you that next Sunday, inshallah, Dr. Layla Uzgur Al Hassan is going to be with us uh, at 12 p.m. Sunday, and uh, she will be talking about chronic Quranic stories, inshallah. Until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum as-salam. Good day. As-salamu alaykum.